In the early days of World War I, it was the year 1914. German forces had been making their way across portions of Europe, including into the country of when they met the British forces. The BEF, as they were called in those days, the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, the BEF, they were very dedicated. They were fighting for what they knew was one of the final lines before their country perhaps could be reached. And they fought fiercely for many days without a break, and finally the soldiers were simply exhausted. So dire was the situation that a word was sent back home, BEF outnumbered three to one. Defeat imminent. And so the nation did what perhaps doesn't happen near as much anymore, but in those days it did. The nation went to church. Churches were filled with thousands of people lifting up the BEF, the British Expeditionary Force, asking for God to intervene because as far as the country was concerned, only a miracle could preserve the BEF. And at first it seemed as though the answer from God was no. On August 26, 1914, as it was later reported in the London Evening News by journalist Arthur Mackin, the BEF were retreating to the city of Mons in Belgium. They were on the run, their forces were depleted, their energy was essentially gone. They were running as quickly as they could, trying to leave the city, trying to find a defensible place to be. The German forces were hot on their heels, uh, both on foot with small arms fire and also on, on cavalry, on horses. But worse than all of that was the artillery that was being shot over the head of the German forces and onto the BEF soldiers. They were being decimated. And then suddenly, the artillery ceased. Now, it's not unusual for one piece of artillery to stop, you know, as they reload or maybe change locations, etc. But all of it, all of the German artillery stopped just like that. And there was this strange silence over that part of the city. The BEF turned around and according to many witnesses, there were four, some counted five, white robed beings, much larger than human beings that were floating off of the ground stand, be, be, between the Germans and the British. The backs of these white-robed beans were to the British facing the Germans, and each one of the beans had their hand out as if to say, I dare you. The Germans were absolutely terrified. They had no idea what to do. The assault quit. They turned tail, took whatever they could, and sprinted back into the city. And the BEF lived to fight another day. Take that story and multiply it by 10, a uh, hundred. Uh, 10 times a thousand, 10,000 times who knows how many, throughout the generations, throughout millennia, that God has used his generally, not always, but mostly unseen army to fight on behalf of his people. I'm speaking, of course, about angels. I, did you know that in 25 plus years of preaching, I have never preached a sermon on angels, much less a series on angels, but I'm about to do it. And my hope is, is that by the end of this short little two-part series, that you two are convinced that at least once every 25 years or so, we ought to spend some time on this topic because as it turns out, it's far more important than most of us think. Now, by the way, I'm not the only one that thinks this, let's see. Jeremy, do I have any slides to play with this morning? I do, ah, oh, there we go, yes. Moving right along here, yes, you know about that, yes. Let's see that, we'll wait for that to go, yep, you know about that. Let me show you this. Acts of the Apostles, page 154, Ellen White has this to say. She says, we need to understand better than we do the mission of the who? 
of the angels. We need to understand better than we do the mission of the angels. It would be well to remember that every true child of God has the cooperation of heavenly beings. Invisible armies of light and power attend the meek and lowly ones who believe and claim the promises of God. Cherubim and seraphim and angels that excel in strength stand at God's right hand, quote, all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Hebrews 1 verse 14. We need to understand better, she says, so let's get right to it. Who are God's angels? What are they like? What do they do? And perhaps most importantly, at least for our purposes here, why should we care? Let's do a little bit of digging. First things first. Uh, the word that we translate as angel actually comes from just two words. This is a little bit unusual. There are many words that you, know, you can translate this Greek word into a variety of ways, a number of Greek words into one English word, that type of dynamic. But there's actually just two here. In Hebrew, it's malach. In Greek, it is angelos. You can see there where we might get the word angel out of the Greek transliteration there. And literally translated, it means messenger. Not angel, that, that has come along later on, but messenger. And just so you're aware, these two words, the one in Hebrew and the one in Greek, can be used to refer to beings other than angels. Sometimes it refers to, for instance, prophets that are messengers for God. Sometimes it refers to Christ himself, even though we wouldn't strictly consider him to be an angel. Context will tell us how we ought to interpret the text. With that in mind, take a look at this. Some things that we should know about what the Bible says about angels. Number one, angels are created beings. They are not to be worshipped. Angels are created beings. They are not to be worshipped. Now, you're going to see why I say this in just a moment. Uh, let me put on the screen here, 1 Timothy 6, verses 15 and 16. It says, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal. How many are immortal? Okay, just one, just God. That's right. He's the only one. Angels do not have immortality. That means they had a beginning point. Since God is the creator, they were created at some time in the past. And because they are created beings, they should not be worshipped. Uh, in fact, Revelation chapter 19, uh, uh, John is uh, dealing right there with the angel. He bows down to worship because the angel is pretty amazing. And the angel says, don't do it. I am a fellow servant with you. Gets him back up on his feet. Now, we don't know exactly when the angels were created. The Bible does not tell us. There are places like, oh, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, which make it clear that angels existed before the creation of this world. But exactly when, uh, don't know, don't know. That apparently, they have been around for quite some time. Now, with that in mind, knowing they are created and that they are not to be worshipped, well, let's get to the part that shows why we even have to bother saying that. Take a look in your Bibles, please. Second Kings, chapter 19, verse 32. Second Kings, chapter 19, beginning with verse 32. That's on page 277 in the blue Bible in the back of the pew in front of you there. Page 277, Second Kings, chapter 19, beginning with verse 32. Let me just set the stage here. Uh, the scene is this, the army of Assyria. The Assyrian army, by the tens of thousands, nearly 200,000 Assyrian soldiers are encircling Jerusalem. That's a bad sign. If you wake up in the morning and you see that, it's going to be a long day, okay? And those soldiers there, I, I've, been to, I've been to Israel, I've been to Jerusalem, I've seen where the outline there, the old city is. Man, that must have been absolutely terrifying for people to look out and to see that many soldiers gathered around. Uh, the king, Hezekiah, is, is terrified. He doesn't know what to do. It is a low point, spiritually speaking, in Israel's history. He's not super you know, confident that they're going to get out of this one by God's hand. He prays a prayer asking for help. And Isaiah the prophet comes to give Hezekiah God's response. Verse 32, chapter 19. Therefore... This is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. Quote, He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a sick of stupidity. One of the most advanced and certainly one of the largest military force on your doorstep. And they're just waiting for you to starve to death. And Isaiah says, well, actually, God has a pretty strong opinion about this. 
God says they will be destroyed. And then God does it. Verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord, how many? One, the, singular. The angel of the Lord went out and put to death a hen in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. No kidding. Hmm. He returned to Nineveh, and I love this last part. I would too. Lesson number two about what the Bible has to say about angels is that angels are supernatural beings of immense power. They are supernatural beings of immense power power. One angel, count them, one finger, one angel goes out in the space of one night. And actually, it's not even one night. I mean, in those days, people got up at the crack of dawn, right? The rooster crows, the sun is starting to peak up, you get up. Before that time is done, 185,000 of the enemy are dead on the ground by one angel, just one. You know, these the story goes very differently when human beings attempt to match the scale of one, just one angel. Uh, do you see now we had to start out by saying angels are not to be worshipped? Beginning, One of the primary things of God's angels is to protect God's people at times by punishing their oppressors. I say again, one of the primary missions of God's angels is to protect God's people at times by punishing their oppressors. Is this thing on? No one said amen to that. I'm a little puzzled. Was that, does that encourage you? Does that, does that? It's one of their primary jobs. These angels want to destroy an entire army in the space of less than an evening, kind of casually wiping off his sword. You know, another day at the office. Those people are on our side. And they stand ready to serve God's people. And there's multiple places in the Bible where this about. Uh, there's the killing of the firstborn in Egypt, which was the final day of Israel finally set free from Egypt. Daniel in the lion's den, an angel king. We live in a dangerous world today. It is so good to know that there are angels that excel in strength that can protect times. And by the way, I know what you're thinking. I answer to it. But I do know this. Someday, soon, when we are safely in heaven and the history of our lives and all of the times when we should have died, of all of the times when another loved one should have perished but did not, should have been infinitely disfigured, but we were not because God's angels stepped in and protected us. answers to that hard question, but I do know that angels are at work today. They are doing incredible things, most of which see and we will not know about it but oh what a day of rejoicing it will be when finally the curtain is pulled back angels protect God's people in many many ways and there is still more uh, Daniel chapter 9 page 633 in your blue Bible Daniel chapter 9 page 633 take a look at verse 20 Again, knowing the clock is just about ready to ding to intercede for his people. Prayer of repentance, Lord, forgive your people, restore, restore your holy hill, Jerusalem, let us rebuild things. And then the answer comes, verse 20. While I, Daniel, was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, now Gabriel is an angel, just to be clear, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you begin to pray, an answer was given which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. 
A fourth thing that the angels of God do is that God's angels openly reveal God's will. They openly reveal God's will. You see, Daniel here had had a vision in Daniel chapter 8. And part of that vision he understood very well because it was very clear. Part of it was interpreted by, the, interpreted by Gabriel at that time. Part of it was not. The vision of the evenings and the mornings, the 2300-day prophecy, Daniel knew it was extremely important, but he could not understand it. So much in despair was Daniel that he didn't understand that he became physically ill. And then he begins to pray, and the angel comes. Now this is not an isolated thing. When an angel comes to openly reveal God's will, there's many instances of this in the Bible. Genesis 16, an angel meets Hagar, Abraham's concubine, directs her to safety. Judges chapter 13, angel appears to Manoah and his wife and directed them regarding God's will for their soon-to-be son, Samson. And of course, Jesus, preceded by John the Baptist, uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's soon-to-be father, is visited by an angel who reveals God's will, and the angel choir on the plains outside of Bethlehem announce and make clear the will of God regarding the birth of Jesus Christ nearby. Now, the reason I bring this up is not because most of you don't know this particular part of angels' work. The stories that I just shared with you, referenced, are pretty well known, at least amongst Christians. But did you know that there are other ways that angels make known the will of God? And if you've never seen this, it will blow your mind. Let me put some things here on the screen for you. Uh, I wish we had time this morning to read the entire chapter of Daniel chapter 10. It is a chapter that rarely makes it onto the radar screen, even of, of students of Bible prophecy. It's kind of, it, these days, people will go to uh, Daniel 7, 8, 9, skip over to chapter 11, and leave out chapter 10, which is a shame, because what we find in chapter 10 is extraordinary. Uh, let me just give you a taste of it here. Let me put a couple verses from Daniel chapter 10 up here. Daniel 10, verse 1. It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So Cyrus, king of Persia, keep that in mind. A revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. Now, pause for just a moment. This great war turns out to be our day. In other words, this is the prelude, not just to what happens described in Daniel chapter 10, but mostly what's described in Daniel chapter 11, which comes all the way down to our day. We are living in the final verses of Daniel chapter 11. And so this great war, this is, the, this is the war between good and evil. This is the great controversy. Daniel is given a vision about our time. Continuing on. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. Skipping down to verse 12. Gabriel shows up. He's going to talk to him now. And here's part of what Gabriel says. Then he, the angel Gabriel, continued. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Okay, so here I am. I'm here to help. Notice what he says in the very next verse. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. What? I mean, like, were we like stuck at a roadblock or something? Was there construction between here and heaven, you know? I mean, Dan, let's just understand what's being said here. Gabriel says, Gabriel, who by the way is the archangel, is the most powerful angel in all of heaven. He took Lucifer's place, all right? So it's not like this guy's lacking in the power and authority. And he says, Daniel, you know, we heard about your prayer in heaven. And I would have been here sooner, but I got delayed for three weeks fighting against the prince of Persia. And just in case we missed the point, it's actually mentioned again. Uh, Daniel 10, verse 20. So he, Gabriel, said, Do you know why I have come to you, Daniel? Soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. All right, let, let's, let's unpack this here, what's actually happening. Because this tells us an extraordinary behind-the-scenes look about what angels do every day. The word for prince in Hebrew here can be translated in a couple of different ways. First of all, it can, of course, mean a ruler. In this case, if it's a human ruler, it's undoubtedly referring to Cyrus, 
Okay, who was the dominant leader there in the Medo-Persian Empire? King of the Persians, he's referred to as. It may mean here that Gabriel, or that Gabriel is going back for three weeks to fight against the evil thoughts that are coming into Cyrus's head. There's a second possible interpretation. The word that's translated here as ruler, prince, excuse me, as, pr- as prince, can also refer to spiritual beings, in this case, demonic entities. In other words, a demonic entity has declared itself to be over Persia, and it was actively working at that time to sway the mind of the king of the Persians, Cyrus. And Gabriel spent three weeks fighting against that particular demonic entity to sway the king of Cyrus in the right direction. You see, at this time, the Jews are no longer mostly in Babylon. I shouldn't say mostly. We don't know the exact numbers, but we do know that many of them by this time had returned to Jerusalem. They were seeking to rebuild it, the temple, the the, the gate, the wall, etc., but it was hard work. Some of the local forces that were still there in that area came up to Jerusalem, and long story short, it was very, very, very discouraging for the Jews that were seeking to rebuild the city. They needed, at that time more than any other, the favor of the monarch. They needed the favor of Cyrus. And apparently the devil hears about it and says, you know what, we better send our best guys to tempt Cyrus to do the wrong thing with regard to the Jews. And word gets back to heaven, and Gabriel goes, not for one week or two weeks, but for three weeks, to fight against those demonic forces that are seeking to dominate the thoughts of the king. Uh, Someone else, uh, maybe you've heard of, uh, has something to say about this too. Prophets and Kings, page 571, 572 says, while Satan was striving to influence the highest powers in the kingdom of Medo-Persia to show disfavor to God's people, angels worked in behalf of the exiles. The controversy was one in which all heaven was interested. Through the prophet Daniel, we are given a glimpse of this mighty struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. For three weeks, Gabriel wrestled with the powers of darkness, seeking to counteract the influences at work on the mind of Cyrus. And before the contest closed, Christ himself came to Gabriel's aid. Quote, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in twenty days, Gabriel declares. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remain there with the kings of Persia. Daniel 10, verse 13. All that heaven could do in behalf of the people of God was done. The victory was finally gained. The forces of the enemy were held in check all the days of Cyrus, and get this, and all the days of his son Cambyses, who reigned about seven and a half years. Talk about a successful trip. Gabriel spends three weeks. The results last for years. The Bible says that not only do God's angels reveal openly the will of God, they also secretly fight for God's will to be done. Now, how exactly this happens, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how people can do that. How beings can do that, can, can, can speak into the mind somehow and suggest. You, you know, the devil's way is forcing people, but God's way is not. And so it's not as though these angels are, are you know, kind of taking possession and, and, and forcing people to do something. But they are speaking here, in this case, into the mind of the king of Persia, seeking to sway him to be favorable to God's people. Now let's just draw that out a little bit. Could it be that we would all be speaking German today if an angel had not thwarted the plans of Adolf Hitler. I don't know, could it be? Does Joe Biden have an angel assigned to him? And just so you know, we're being fair. Did Donald Trump have an angel assigned to him? Could it be that we need to pray that the leader of the Taliban will have an angel assigned to him or two? You know, this particular work of angels, again, when we get to heaven and we watch the film, 
Only then will we fully understand how intricately involved angels were in the course of history, never forcing, but tempting to do good, if I can put it that way. And yet, even though this chapter is in the Bible, how often have we prayed for this to happen? You know, the Holy Spirit, most powerful being in the universe, right? Holy Spirit influences people's minds, etc. And there's an entire unseen army who is dedicated to seeking to influence human affairs in the right direction. Now we can begin to understand why it is when the four angels that are holding back the winds of strife, when they let go, no wonder it's so bad because it's not just those four angels, it's an entire army of them that have been seeking to hold back evil on the planet. Maybe it's time that we added a line or two to our prayers. Lord, please send your angels that excel in strength to and fill in the blank. Human history has been altered many a time because people listened to the good temptations of God's angels. In the last days, the activity of angels skyrockets. We'll talk more about that next week. But in the meantime, let us pray that the Lord will use every resource, including his angels, to keep the gospel window open. And a final thing. Let me put on the screen here a few texts very quickly here. Exodus chapter 36, verse 8. Those of you that have studied this portion of the Bible know that in the early portion of the wanderings of the children of Israel in the desert, after the Exodus, after Mount Sinai, they were given instructions to build a sanctuary. The sanctuary would be the place where the salvation, not just of the Jews, but ultimately of humanity through the sanctuary in heaven, would be determined. It's a hugely important building. Very specific instructions were given, including these. All the skilled men, it says, among the workmen, made the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple and scarlet yarn, with cherubim, cherubim are angels, that's right, worked into them. So there, there's cherubims em embroidered, placed into the curtains of the temple. He, Bezalel, this is now Exodus 37, verses 6 and 7, Bezalel was a very gifted uh, artisan, made the atonement cover. Where did that go? On top of the ark, exactly. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim, two angels, out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. So let's just make sure we understand what we're talking about here. This is the ark of the covenant, made of acacia wood there, very intricate in its design, put together by this master craftsman, overlaid with pure gold on top, and then these angels are placed on top. Now, what about these angels? There's a little bit more detail that's given here. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub, second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the what? That's really important. This is known as the mercy seat or the seat of judgment. The presence of God, not, not, not figuratively speaking, the literal presence of God hovered in this place over the mercy seat. Underneath the mercy seat inside the ark was the Ten Commandments, the terms of God's covenant with his people. And lo and behold, who's watching with an endless gaze are two angels on the curtains of the sanctuary are angels watching intently. There's only one conclusion that is possible, our final one for this morning. God's angels are intelligent beings that are intensely interested in how the great controversy between good and evil will end. You know, I think too often when we think about angels, we kind of make them into robots. God speaks, boom, they do it. Kind of, you know, God programs there at his keyboard and poof, off they go and do things. Uh, they very stoic, kind of flat, emotional affect here. That is not the case. That is not the case. It cannot be the case. These angels are so interested and such players in the great controversy 
of consequence, that they are actually portrayed in the center of the salvation universe for human beings, in the very most holy place, looking down there to see what will transpire in the great controversy. You see, sin did not start here. As much as we like to think we invented most everything, we didn't invest this one. We, we, we caught it. Okay, we got it secondhand. Sin began in heaven with these angels. And the good angels, the ones that did not go over to Satan's side, saw it from the very beginning until this day, right now as I speak. They've seen the whole thing, and guess what? That means they have questions. They have questions. They've seen all the damage that can be done, and yet there are questions that remain. Some of you might be thinking, oh, come on, how can they have questions? Haven't they seen enough? I mean, these super intelligent beings, what about the crucifixion? Surely that must have answered all of their questions. It is finished, Jesus said. Well, let me put something up here for you. These angels, which are depicted as being in the sanctuary, in the most holy place, covering that particular most important spot for our salvation. The angels that still to this day, as Jesus, as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, their questions are not yet all answered. But Desire of Ages, page 761. When Christ died on the cross, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels, that's who we're talking about here, the ones on the side of the sanctuary in the most holy place, before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe, he had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. You say, well, there it is, Pastor Shane. There it is. All their questions are answered. I wish. She goes on. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed, and for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. I was telling my Sabbath school class this morning, I feel like my questions are answered. I've had enough, I'm ready to go home. I'm tired of the wars and disease and death and innocent people perishing and all of this stuff. How come they can't see it? And yet as soon as I say that, I have to remind myself, could it be that there are far deeper things at stake than I realize? Could it be that the mystery of iniquity really goes deeper than my human brain can understand? And whether I am truly satisfied or not, could it be that the angels that were there in the beginning, the ones that will be part of the Lord's administration from now until through all eternity, they see things that as yet are unanswered. So no wonder they have front row seats. No wonder God didn't put them into the curtains on the outside uh, uh, barrier around the sanctuary. He puts them on the inside of the sanctuary itself and even into the most holy place. And if we could pull back the curtain here this morning, we would see that every last one of you has one of these interested angels standing there next to you. They wanna see how it's going to end they want to see what happens when the devil is given complete control. They want to see what a human being can do when they fully give themselves to Jesus Christ. You see, the angels that sit in the courtroom of heaven, Daniel chapter 7, are an extremely important part of exonerating the reputation of their Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Turns out the great controversy isn't all about you and me. Turns out there's a much bigger picture that we have the privilege of cooperating with heavenly angels in. You know, to me this leads me to one final overarching conclusion. We are not alone. All of heaven is on our side. I'm glad to hear you say amen. You were a little weak earlier on, but I think you've learned something along the way. Yeah, this is great news. 
the, the power of the Holy Spirit transforming a human heart, there's no replacement for that. These angels are not even trying to do that. But isn't it good to know that the second string is incredible? And they are all here working on our behalf. Yeah, final quotation here. Acts of the Apostles, 152, a few snippets here. To the worker for God, the record of these angel visits should bring strength and courage. Today, as truly as in the days of the apostles, heavenly messengers are passing through the length and breadth of the land, seeking to comfort the sorrowing, to protect the impenitent, to win the hearts of men to Christ. We cannot see them personally. Nevertheless, they are with us, guiding, directing, protecting. Again and again had the encouraging words of angels renewed the drooping spirits of the faithful. It is the work of the angels to come close to the tried, the suffering, the tempted. They labor untiringly in behalf of those for whom Christ died. All the heavenly angels are at the service of the humble, believing people of God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Final little story for you. And this one is about me. When I was about four or five years old, uh, my mother said I would climb everything but the refrigerator, and I soon proved that to be wrong. Uh, I love to climb on stuff, love to play, love to be active. And when I was four or five years old, uh, it was camp meeting time in western Washington state. We were on the campus of Auburn Adventist Academy. And they used to have a, a dormitory there called Gibson Hall. It's been long since torn down and <laughs> not a moment too soon. It was a respiratory nightmare. Uh, but in those days, you could still stay there during camp meeting. And I remember uh, very clearly, it was some afternoon. Uh, I don't know where my folks were, but I knew where I was. I was playing with the other kids in the stairwell. And the stairwell there was, was pretty common. Those of you that spent any time uh, in Adventist dormitories of the era, you know, kind of cinder block uh, stairwells, all concrete, you know, metal railings, this kind of thing. About 10 steps going down this flight, and then it makes this U-turn, about, you know, six feet wide or so, and then it goes another 10 steps down to the basement on that side of Gibson Hall. And there was, on, on going down there, as, as there should have been, there was a guardrail, this, this handrail, banister. And the banister, I remember it, it was, it was one of those that was custom made, it was welded into place, and it stuck out from the wall, oh, probably about that much or so. And, and some of the kids were sliding down, some of the bigger kids, they were sliding on it, but they couldn't do it very well. Because, you know, with only that much space between the banister and the wall, it's kind of hard to get on there and stay on that. I was just a little boy, and I saw the big kids doing that, I thought, well, I, I can do better than that. And I got up there to the very top, and I climbed up, and I got my little leg over there, and I leaned back. And now, see, I've got a safety mechanism. I'm not going to fall off because I've got this leg inside, right? And when I thought the time was right, I released, and whew, ten seconds. Now, ten steps. You can pick up a fair amount of speed when you're sliding down like that. And I picked up a fair amount of speed. And I remember going down very clearly, sliding down there. And my four or five year old mind had not had any classes in physics as of yet. And at the bottom, you know, there's, there's, there's where it attaches to the wall and then there's this U, you know, that goes around so then it continues on down the rest of the basement. And I remember my leg touching that, that, that attachment point at the bottom. And the next thing I remember, I don't remember anything in between, the next thing that I remember as I was sitting on the steps over here going down, on the far side, facing this way, facing down the steps, against the wall there. No scratches, no impact, no nothing. You know, when a four or five year old is sliding down a banister and they catch their foot, on their, they catch their leg on the end, one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna snap a few bones here on this one if it catches you, or if it flips you off the end, the next thing that you meet is concrete in your cranium. Okay. And when I opened my eyes, and that, and that just, I mean, it, it, no time passed in my, in, my, in my memory, just immediately, I was sitting down about six feet away on that step, on the far side against the wall there, facing down. Now, I can't prove it to you, I don't have any video of that day. But I know in my heart that that day, God said, not yet. Today is not the day. 
I have plans for this little boy. And I think an angel took his pinky <laughs> and caught that little boy and set me safely on the other side. And that's one of the reasons, one of the many, why I can stand here today and talk to you about God's angels. God has not left us alone. There is instead an invisible army that is ready, willing, and able to fight the battle right next to us. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for your promises of protection, Lord. We thank you for the gift of your angels to us, Lord. It is more than we deserve. Yet you lavish your resources on us. I pray, Lord, I pray even now, Lord, and for all those that are willing, they can join me in the prayer, that indeed you would sell your, send your angels that excel in strength, Lord, to the various heads of state, to the leaders in our world, Lord, that need to be tempted in the right direction. Bless them, Lord, with that influence. May your angels be able to prevail. We thank you for these things, and we pray them in your name.